So we have Joanne Canning back tonight. We're so grateful to have her speaking about container gardening. Joanne has been a certified master gardener for over 25 years. Her gardening experience started over 50 years ago in her mother's backyard in West Vancouver and her grandparents' farm in the Fraser Valley. Her own gardens have included a home orchard, ornamentals, urban food crops, and of course, container gardening, which she will talk about tonight. She has written about gardening, photographed gardens, taught, mentored, and volunteered on community gardening projects as well. So without further ado, we welcome back Joanne Canning. Welcome, Joanne. Thank you, Kendra. Um, okay, I will share my screen here and we'll get started. There we go. So, this is, gosh, look at that, container gardening. And um, we'll come to this particular uh, container. I'll mention it later on because there's something particular about it that you might find interesting. So it's presented by me uh, and uh, as Kendra said, uh, partnering um, with um, the Vancouver Island Regional Library and the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Associated. Uh, and, um, got to do a, a bit more uh, housekeeping. So this seminar is the property of the Vancouver Island um, Regional um, Library and the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association of BC. Um, and it is intended for educational purposes only. So you can't use uh, part of it um, for commercial uh, purposes. And uh, the information um, in this seminar, like all Master Gardener information, is science-based and it's accurate to the best of our knowledge. So any use of this of the information in this seminar is at your um, discretion. And most of the images and videos uh, that I've used are from open internet sources. Um, which is public domain, um, where they are individually uh, owned. Um, I've made notes, like you'll see this one here. It's one of mine, a water feature of mine, um, and you'll see those throughout the um, seminar. And if it interests you, you can see um, what website to go to because it'll be right on that image. Um, and so we're thanking the public agencies and the artists and all the commercial enterprises for helping us put this on. So let's begin. Why use containers? Um, we have several reasons for using containers. Um, and um, one of the things that I discovered when I was doing all my research for um, this seminar um, was uh, I always do a, a review of, of, of the books that are out there to see what the fashion is, what people are saying, what they're emphasizing. And one of the problems that I discovered was that there is an awful lot of focus on fashion, how things look. I mean, you can just see this um, cactus here. It's quite exquisite. It's very unique. But not a lot is really uh, focused on the soil, which is everything in a garden, um, the watering systems, and in particular, the containers. So if you're looking for um, some real fashion statements, we will be getting to those at the end. But I'm going to focus on um, the science and a bit of the art of container gardening. And I want to explain about the three elements of container gardening, which are the pot, the soil, and yes, the plant. But you need to get the environment correct before you can um, be successful. So I'm going to try to give you the tools to be successful at this uh, type of gardening, which has been going on for thousands of years. Um, so First, we'll go over the containers, then we'll go over soil and water, uh, and then we'll talk about how plants work and how to combine them and how they interact with each other and with, and 
with people. Um, and then that will be uh, where we go into designs. So why do we want to use them? There's some pretty practical reasons. We can have no soil. We can have poor soil. We can have a lot of pests with soils. There are even types of food crops that were developed because the because the soil had been so contaminated with pests. Kohlrabi is a very good example. Um, it wasn't as subject to club root that a lot of the uh, coal crops were. So um, it, you can also have contaminated soil um, and that soil needs to rest. Uh, so where are you gonna put your plants? Um, we can have a harsh climate. Um, we can have an area that's too small, and that's really one of the concerns with a lot of urban gardening. We can have an area that's too dry, can't get water to it, um, or we can have an area that's too wet. And um, so I'm going to bring my plants up away from that wet. Now, here's the, the good reasons, the pros. You can grow out of zone plants. Um, you can grow plants in small spaces. You can also change to match uh, the decor. So that's because container plants have an intimacy to them and they can be very much part of that outdoor room um, or your patio or the courtyard off your apartment. And you want to change those things from time to time. We'll talk about that. We can miniaturize trees, which means we can grow fruit. We can control the light by moving things. Uh, we can create focal points or pockets of color in a very bland uh, backyard, uh, for instance. We can escape a harsh climate by moving things indoors, for instance. Um, and we can move plants seasonally, which is great because you can change the palette from season to season. Now, the downside is they're often higher maintenance. Um, we don't think of maintenance um, with pots so much. We think of it in the garden. But um, in order to have a successful container garden, you really have to understand how to maintain it. Because um, the one thing about containers is they're too hot, they're too cold, they're too dry, they're too wet. They're too small, they're too big. So getting it all right um, is part of that maintenance. Um, you really do need to buy the soil to start and we'll talk about that. Your soil will need replenishing. In a garden, you, you would add a, a, your fertilizer or your mulch or your compost, but often with a container, the plant uses up that soil, uses everything of it, and you have to um, replenish it. So it's not just top it up. Um, we'll talk about that. Your plants can outgrow your pot. Um, you can have problem with water access or even water damage. If, uh, for instance, you're on a deck or you have a window box um, on the third floor, the water can roll down the side of the building and create stains. We can talk about that. Planters can be costly. They don't have to be, but they can be. Um, and also, if you're growing fruit crops, you might have to uh, pollinate them by hand. But we'll also talk about um, uh, pollinator crops in pods. So let's start with how to choose a container. Um, there really are um, three different seminars. Um, that we've collapsed in one because um, growing annuals, growing perennials, and growing food crops have very different techniques. But the point is that in choosing the container, um, they all have limits regarding materials and shape and mobility. Um, and we all always have to deal with soils, soil types. And we also have to deal with the plant's spatial needs. So when you're choosing a container, you often have a plant in mind. And um, you want to know um, how to be successful with it. So when you're choosing a container for a plant, um, you need to, to sturdy regarding the weight of the soil in the plant. Um, it has to be the appropriate material. Um, 
for instance, uh, you want you're going to have it in full sun. Well, you're not. You don't want a metal one. Um, if you're going to have bog plants, um, you don't want wood unless it's lined with plastic. Um, it also needs to have the appropriate drainage for the plant. Um, for example, a cactus or uh, an arbutus tree needs very lean soil, whereas um, uh, an erica or a rhododendron needs a, a high organic soil that doesn't have the fast runoff that you need with a cactus. So you need to uh, um, have that drainage in mind when you're looking at the pot. Um, you need a minimal upkeep um, unless the changes uh, are planned, like you're going to paint them. Um, and um, you also don't want it to damage the surface. So you need to know the weight. You need to look at how rough it is, um, you need to look whether it's color fast. Um, and you also need to know how fragile the surfaces are, uh, particularly if you're going to move it like Duradec will, and, uh, will, will tear and stain. Sidewalk and other cement surfaces will stain. Wood deck can grow mold. Um, this is not only important for the homeowner. If you're a renter or you live in a condo, these can get to be really big issues. So always um, think of those. Now, um, when, you're, when you're thinking of those, you're going to look for where's the drain? Where will the pot drain to? Will it drain directly under? Do I have to uh, put in a tube to move it away? Um, is there any toxicity of the materials um, or in the coatings? How am I going to deal with that? What's the weight of the complete package? And we're going to talk about soil and weight and volume. Um, and this is a big deal um, on a lot of balconies and decks. Um, you need to know that. And also safety, which is part of weight, but also um, will you have a strong enough hook and will you have a strong enough anchor point if you're doing a hanging um, uh, planter? And the last thing we're going to look for when we choose a container is how it's going to interact with, with the plants that we put in it and the environment around it. In other words, am I going to be dealing with children and pets who might want to climb on it, chew parts of it, um, or get digging in it? In it, um, and is this okay? Um, uh, so, or do I need to keep it out of the way? Um, ease of access um, in terms of getting a hose to it, um, or um, can I put a rain barrel nearby? Um, what? Uh, how am I going to get soil and compost in and out of it and what about mobility uh, winter storage um, do do i want to make sure that it's got uh wheels under it um, or do i have a dolly that i can tip onto it and move it um, and how often are you going to need to replenish the soil when we talk about the difference between annuals and perennials and whatnot um, that becomes uh important so these are all maintenance things. Also, are my uh, amendments or my fertilizer going to have odors? Um, certain types of uh, liquid fish fertilizer can repel uh, humans. Um, blood meal, if you're using the seed meals, um, sometimes even canola meal can attract um, vermin. Um, uh, rats are very good at digging up stuff. So let's look at materials what kind of materials i can use you see down the right there i've got some traditional terracotta pots um, i've got um, these wonderful metal tubs and i've got glazed pots and so i can use glazed clay i can use hyper tufa i can use metal stone or cement terracotta wood wicker or plastic now for plastic i want to look for number five. And I want to always avoid one, three, six, and seven. So things to remember when I'm choosing uh, a container. Um, if you're um, looking at different types, um, and we'll, we'll see that on the next page, and you also have that in your handouts, always avoid polystyrene. Um, it, um, 
uh, has toxic uh, off gases and many municipalities now ban it. But sometimes you'll find stuff in a, a secondhand store. Always make sure that the commercial pots are labeled as food safe. Um, many of them now are not just um, labeled with the numbers, but they'll say food safe. Um, not just plant safe, because you'll get some that say plant safe, that they may be fine for the plants, but they can still leach chemicals into the environment. So um, these are some very good choices. And you notice um, I spoke about the, the first image, and that was hypertufa. So it is um, a combination of, it's kind of like a giant silly putty. It's um, uh, Portland cement, core fiber, sand, um, perlite, and you, you mix it up and it begins to set and you can carve it. And so that's, uh, I've, you've, I've made hypertufa pots over the years and they're, they're really kind of, kind of neat because they're so versatile. So um, here we have, um recycling which of course is a style of its own i just love the one on the bottom with the guitar um and here's a list you can use all these things if you use them right um on the right um and i've used this type of planter um it's just a bag uh and it's cut like an old fashioned uh cereal box you used to get with kids and it's put up on a pallet you notice there's um, places where you you uh, stick a hole in the bag and then um, a regular bag which is about uh, 16 kilos is is about 35 pounds and that's what you'll see with most of these bags uh, in garden centers and um, so you remove the soil you amend it you refill it so it's ready to go and you can grow stuff in it and then you can empty the soil out in the beds. Um, you can empty the soil um, as um, over top of your lawn to uh, um, uh, uh, to reseed. Um, you can keep it, you can amend it, all sorts of things. Oh, didn't want to. There we go. Got a problem here. There we go. So this you have in your uh uh handouts and all the pros and cons um for me the best recycled garden uh, uh container garden i ever saw was one at a retired uh, dairy farmer's house um he had taken his milking machines and made them into a fountain and then the containers he used were all his old feed buckets and the uh, planters and um, the patio furniture were all wood from his old barn. It was quite charming. Um, now, um, before we get on to container sizes, um, you can make old surfaces safe. Um, you can paint it, um, or you can remove the paint and paint over. Um, but generally, if you simply rough your surface, um, you can um, use exterior acrylic paint. Um, all exterior acrylic paint that's labeled for use on plastic and metal are considered food safe paints. Um, those are the paints you see where kids are painting rocks. That's, that's exterior acrylic paint. Um, it's always best to seal the inside for safety um, unless you really know what was in them originally. And you can do that with um, plastic. You can do that with um, landscape cloth. Uh, you can do that by painting it. Um, you, with, with wood, um, you seal it with tongue oil or linseed oil. Now, both of these will seal and harden the pots, um, but they allow the pots to breathe. So um, you can use it on terracotta um, and unglazed clay as well, the tongue and the linseed. Um, the, if you want one sealer and protector, um, old-fashioned milk paint um, will seal, preserve, and yet keep breathable every surface that you're going to use as a container. Um, then if you want to seal it, you can seal it. So um, 
Oh, just a just a note while I think of it. Um, all of the tables and whatnot that are that are in the handouts. Um, for those that are going to be watching the seminar, I've put them on slides so you can simply um, do a screen capture and then print them. Um, and uh, just pause the recording, take the screen print, and then continue. And that's why um, some of these um, tables and whatnot are here. So container sizes. Now that we know about uh, choosing a container, um, we need to know how to measure sizes because we must know the best size for the plant you want to grow. Uh, and um, the problem is, and you'll see here, trade gallons, my goodness, um, versus true gallons. Um, whether it's US or Imperial, um, how to deal with the changing those to the metric system, uh, how to match the pot to your plant. Uh, that's that all these things um, need to be taken into consideration. Uh, so play a little. Look at a look at a bag. Um, pour it into a container, like say a tote that you think might be right. Um, after a while, you kind of develop an eye for the for the volumes, and you can get quite accurate. Now this gives you a starting point. Um, Remember that when you're dealing with gallons, all gallons are US gallons. They're not imperial gallons. And you'll notice here pot equivalent US gallons. It, you'll always see US gallons. Trade gallons are kind of like um, the nominal two by four. At most, it's one and three quarter inches. Uh, it's often just one and a half inches. So. Um, a trade gallon, they'll say, oh, well, you know, it's a gallon pot, but you actually can't get a gallon of soil in it. Um, and if you tried to put a gallon of soil and a plant in it, um, no way, uh, because it's the minimum uh, allowance by the trade, which becomes the maximum they're going to they're going to make it. And so if you find you're, you're looking at um, a commercial pot and you're thinking that's kind of small, it's probably because they're saying it's a gallon, but it's a trade gallon. Um, so for many of you, um, these are going to be close enough um, because you're not really um, uh, crowding your plants in your pots and it gives you a good starting point um, and here's another one that's actually more accurate it's from a cannabis growing site and um, it gives you a pretty good accurate idea of the average diameter of the pot which is of course measured at the top not the bottom and um, the depth of the pot in inches. Again, you see you're dealing in um, uh, American uh, volumes. Um, that's on your handouts. So we're going to talk about calculating volumes. Um, now don't, don't, don't freak out because you only have to do this once. Um, and what I did was that I calculated all my volumes and then I wrote them on the inside uh, lip of at the top of my container and uh, used white um, white marker pen. And so I knew exactly what my volume was. Now, when you're calculating volumes, the general rule is convert all your numbers to centimeters, then calculate your volume according to the shape and then convert it to liters. And that will give you your volume. Uh, and so here we have for cylinders and here we have for cubes and got it all written down there and all the conversions that you need. Give it a try, do it once, and then you're done. Now, let's get on to soil. Um, when you know the volume of your root ball, um, you can go to the tables you've got 
um, and um, what you want to do is allow two inches um, in that diameter and in the height and that will give you a good idea of what size pot you need because you always need a minimum of two inches between the root ball and the pot for your plant to thrive. Now, a plant can exist root bound, but it's not gonna thrive. And if your garden is a pot garden, you want your plants to thrive. And if part of that pot garden is a food garden and they don't have enough uh, food, your tomatoes are not gonna ripen. Um, it's just going to be decorative. It's not really going to be nutritionally dense and there's not going to be a big enough harvest. So um, by knowing your pot vol volumes, you know how much soil to have on hand. Uh, you can calculate the correct amount of amendments and fertilizers and that is key. You can't get it right unless you know how much you're putting in to how much soil. And also, if you know your pot volume, say you have a pot um, and you know how much soil is going to fit in there, you can go to the garden center um, uh, and pull a plant up and look at the diameter of the root and the height and you know whether it's going to fit in your pot or whether it's going to be too big. And if it's a little bit on the small side, well, that's good. It will grow into the pot, but you need to know it's uh, mature size. Um, and also, um, you can um, do it the other way. You can have a plant, um, you look at the root ball, you add two inches and go out and buy a pot that's going to fit that. So that's why those pot volumes are very important. Um, and for crops, say like carrots, um, you need two inches or your carrot is not going to grow properly to maturity. Um, so that's uh, five five centimeters taller um, than what the mature plant's going to be. So whether it's carrots or whether it's shrubs, that's important. And your choices become potted up to something bigger, which we're going to look at, and um, or prune the roots, which is not as difficult as one thinks. But that's not something we're going to get into it. So I want to play this video for you because we see this a lot. Now just watch, so she's, she's done the correct thing there. She's loosened the soil, but look what she's doing. She's pressing it together and then she's cramming it into a pot that's a wee bit bigger and then she's throwing the soil on it. Now, look at the soil. Um, that soil is, uh, has got no proper drainage in it. She's compacting the roots. And when you transplant and you pot up, you do exactly the opposite. You pull the roots apart. By doing what she's doing, you're going to make them grow around each other. And they're not going to use the soil in the larger pot. So look again. See, she's pressed it all together when she should be pulling it apart. She's also not um, uh, set the pot correctly because she didn't put any new soil in the bottom. She just grabbed it and, and pushed it down into the, into the uh, bottom of the pot. So um, when you're potting up, um, these are things that you need, to con uh, you need to concern yourself with. See, there she goes again. So let's look at soils. Now, all potting soil needs compost um, because compost in soil is what retains the moisture. Um, moisture allows the nutrients to dissolve and get to the plant through um, water and air movement. Now, all potting soil also needs coarse particles, which can be perlite or sand and gravel pieces. So you've got air and water um, that will allow the roots to reach, okay? Um, or it's gonna be compacted like the video. Um, now, always start with plain or multi-use potting soil as a base. Um, the, and sometimes they're hard to find. A lot of potting soils um, have got amendments. You don't need the amendments. You shouldn't have the amendments. 
partly because things like um, time released um, uh, capsules, they, they're dependent on the temperature and they release at different times and that might not suit your plant. Um, uh, like they'll have uh, um, very, very high levels of amendments when you don't want that in your plant. So how do you know what to add? But if you start with a multi-use soil as a base, um, you'll know where to build your mix. Um, never use garden dirt or topsoil as a base. Um, it is not sterile. It hasn't been mixed correctly. And you're just asking for problems. You're, in, you're going to be introducing things you don't want in your pots. Now, um, you can use your own compost if you know how to make it and and it's been aged um, but you can buy compost as well and i found using sea soil it's a it's a local product and it's um, a very good product and it's um, called compost but it's actually composted soil um, makes a very good base so um, if you have just potting soil you can use sea soil as your compost as well. And I've given you two general uh, mixes. And then down below, there's the specialty mix. Now you notice that I've um, made uh, uh, a note on worm castings, um, a very important additive to um, containers because the, the um, worm a poo um, conditions the soil and it uh, contains a hyaluronic acid, um, which is like a compost activator. And it also activates the natural um, molds um, and bacteria. You add compost and you add bits of manure. Um, it just um, helps them all kick off and um, become a very good soil mix. Um, I used to, raise my own worms and um, the difference between um, the containers with worm castings and the containers without was very obvious. Um, but you can buy the worm castings. You'll notice that I make a note in, in food crops um, on kelp and seed meal. Um, kelp meal is um, slightly pricey and it's very much worth um, the, um, the price because, first of all, you use very little and it has a lot of mineral trace minerals um, in it. Um, and uh, trace minerals are dependent upon temperature of the soil, except when they're in the form of seaweed. Seaweed um, has an amazing ability because of where it comes from to uh, have your minerals in water soluble form. So always use, when you're using your amendment, always use kelp meal. You can also use steamed fish bone meal. You can, you can have fish uh, bone meal, but steamed fish bone meal um, uh, has made the calcium um, bioavailable. So it's something that if you're growing tomatoes, which need more calcium, you really want the fish bone meal. So those, those are some of your choices for that. Oop. Just hit the wrong button. There we go. So once we've got a base of our soil, let's look at um, amendments and the difference. Amendments are what you add to your soil base, and they're nutrient-rich organic products uh, that enhances the uh, soil's ability to feed the plants for the season and over the long term, like for more than one season, if you're, say, planting slow-growing uh, conifers. Um, now, they also become part of the soil structure. Remember, as talking about the kelp and how it uh, um, becomes water soluble um, and it becomes part of the soil itself. And I've mentioned um, the worm castings and some consider this fertilizer, I consider it an amendment. Um, and the note here is always keep some extra uh, to add at mid season if your plants are really going gangbusters, like if you're growing um, 
hanging baskets uh, annuals, okay? Fertilizers are extra food uh, that a plant will need. Um, uh, it's, again, you're feeding the soil, you don't wanna feed the plant, but there will be times when your soil runs out. And unfortunately, when the soil runs out, it runs out. It's kind of like run out of air. And I've tested plants where uh, on food crops, I've tested, I've tested a, uh, I had some chard and I let one just grow until it used up the soil and stopped. And then I did one where I did a regular small feeding and it kept growing and growing. The problem with the one that stopped is that it never really started again. When plants, when plants shut down, they shut down. And so um, when you're dealing with uh, containers, you always want to start with a rich base and you always want to um, be prepared to give it light feeding because you need that extra in the plant. And um, the extra food comes in two types. Um, it's the annual one, and that's mixed in with the with the amendments when you when you freshen your soil. So you've got your seed meals like like uh, uh, canola meal, um, uh, sunflower seed meal, um, things like that. You've got kelp meal. I mentioned steamed uh, fish bone meal um, castings, um, and then during the season you really will find that your liquid fertilizers are your key because you can add it according to the label. So you already know your volume, right? You know how much to give it. And you can add it to the soil or you can put it into your watering system. And we'll, talk, we'll be talking about watering systems. So here we have replenishing the soil over winter. Um, and what I learned to do was that I removed the soil and I mixed it, I layered it with manure and fresh compost, and then I covered it. And then I cleaned out my pots and I stored them. Next spring, I had fabulous soil. All I had to do was top it up with my summer mix. Um, now for self-watering pots, um, I used to empty the reservoir and then um, dump the soil into the reservoir and then um, mix all the, the uh, compost and manure into it, put it back in the planter, clean the reservoir and cover the reservoir uh, and, and use the, the reservoir as the cover. And then you'll see there's the other way here. You can just dump everything out um, and then put your planter back in the reservoir and fill it and then fill the soil in. Either way, um, if you're replenishing the soil for perennial pots, lift the plant out, set it aside. Um, Mix in your compost and your amendments um, to replenish the whole soil. And then if you find the soils compacted, add some gravel and then replant the plant. So let's get on to watering methods. You'll see on the left here, um, that's a, a rain barrel system that's come off the eaves. Um, and of course, the, um, the good old uh, system. <laughs> just filling up the filling up the uh, watering can okay um now we have um uh um false bottom pots and we have um true self-watering containers and i'm going to um oop didn't want to do that um wanted to go to view um, oh, didn't want to do that either. Okay. Okay. Um, got ahead. I wanted to show you something, but I'm, uh, can you, oh, here we are here. Um, that's what I wanted to do. Um, now in false bottom pots, um, you'll find that um, the the pot is um, has got what looks like um, a sieve in the bottom. Um, that's 
like an inverted hat. So the sieve is here, and then you've got this inverted hat, and it sits in the bottom of the pot. And that's supposed to hold the soil up and then um, have a wick of soil in the bottom, and then the water will sit there. The problem with that type of system is that the, um, the, the water um, will still come up into the into the pot and it will um, uh, soak the the bottom of the pot and um, the plant will be unhealthy um, so let's look at what um, a self-watering planter will do um, um, self-watering planters um, in a container garden um, are the most um, efficient because um, the plant demands um, water when it needs it. And the one on the right here, um, you'll notice um, is made from an old tote. And um, in the websites, you can um, find uh, uh, on the, the slides at the end, you can see um, a website that gives you this. But basically you've got a tote, They've cut the uh, hole um, from the top, poked it with holes, and crammed it down in there. Um, then they've poked an overhole, uh, overflow hole um, in the side, um, and you've got the watering tube that goes down in below, and you've got the wicking uh, vessel, which they've used um, uh, an old plastic uh, um, kitchen uh, container and poked holes in it. The problem with this is nothing ever really fits. And I've tried several different kinds over the years. What they've done here is some landscaping cloth that stops the soil leaking into the reservoir, because that's always a problem. What I discovered was that landscaping cloth isn't enough. Um, what, I, what I used to do was that I took my landscaping cloth and I made a bag out of it that sat inside the uh, tote. I finally ended up going to just putting another, a smaller tote inside and cutting the uh, bottom out of the small tote. And that worked. So it was um, very efficient. Now this little guy on the left is really kind of cool because, um, and you'll note the reservoir reduces the soil volume. What they've done is that they've taken a pot They've put a plastic cup through the side of an old milk jug, and then they've also cut a hole um, and um, where you could put the water into the reservoir. Um, that's great because there you have a pot that you already have, and you have um, uh, a hole in the bottom for if it gets very wet and rainy, and you have a reservoir. But just remember that the reservoir reduces the soil volume. So you'll have to remeasure. Also, always pack the soil into the wicking vessel. Here, a plastic cup works well. Put lots of holes in it because you cannot change the laws of physics, Captain. And that's how the plant gets the um, water. The soil's got to be in that vessel. Very important. Um, and of course, you see, this is where the liquid fertilizer comes in. You know the volume of water in the in your reservoir, and you uh, same with the big tote. Um, you'll know the volume, just height times width times uh, um, height times width times depth um, or length, and um, so you know how much water's in there, and you'll know how much liquid fertilizer to put in there. Also, you don't need um to water it every day so um you can go away for a week if you have to and the plant will get the plant will take what it needs and um also when you've cut the top out of it you have this this rim and you can uh for winter you can put remay over top of it and clamp the remay down by by using that um rim from the top um now, of course, the problems is um, the same as other containers. 
and they really need to be emptied at the end of the year because you 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 just end up with a lot of mud in the bottom and uh they need to be clean um and um i also i um used an old garden hose as my um tube it's my filling tube um i used landscape uh bags inside so at the end of the year i could just pull that landscaping cloth out and it would would have all the soil in there um so if i i wouldn't have to tip the tote over which probably had water in it and so then i would have mud um so that was very handy to have it completely filled with the landscaping cloth um and the other um way was to just put a smaller tote in the bigger tote and cut the hole in the bottom of the smaller tote and then put my landscaping uh cloth in that and i kept it up off the uh um the the um reservoir tote by um some bricks just held it up just fine so um the other way that you can create um i mean i'm sure you're saying oh but wait a minute i've got these these big uh plant trays the water trays and my plant uh all the pots i already have sit in that plant tray there's a really good cheat you can do um a lot of your pots of course will always will already have the holes in the bottom and uh so there's going to be a way to get the water in now you remember that false bottom i talked about you can put that in the pot and then put the pot into your tray um where that the overflow tray and the pot will sit down um into the water but the soil will be above the water as long as you know where the false bottom in your pot is the other thing you can do is that if your um, pot um, does not have uh, any holes in it um, you can um, put a hole in the bottom of the pot put the pot up on um, pot feet inside your tray and put that cup you can use a beer cup, you know one of those plastic beer cups or a plastic drinking cup through the hole um, with lots of holes in it and um, the soil into the hole and it will wick up so instead of a tube you're simply putting it into the bottom of the into the tray that's going to protect your your deck or whatever so there's two ways of doing that look at this a bit think it through the penny will drop um and um not to worry about it um now someone is saying um can't find soil that doesn't have peat well marilyn i'm so glad you mentioned that because it is very important to have a no peat soil mix what you will find, Marilyn, is that um, often the cheaper the soil, um, the cheaper the potting soil, the less amendments it will have. I have found no peat mixes at um, Share Care, um, also Bucker Fields. And um, the reason you don't want to use peat for those that, that don't know is that, first of all, it will dry out and it gets hydrophilic. In other words, it won't let you soak up moisture. Second of all, it's not eco-friendly. Um, you're really destroying a very delicate environment. So, and you don't need it. Um, core fiber will hold um, twice as much water as peat if you're wetting peat so core fiber is a leftover from the coconut uh, industry it's absolutely biodegradable it's a wonderful product and um uh it's not expensive and it is um as useful as mulch and i've used it for years so let's go on to fun stuff um, oh, there we go. We got the arrow going, which I got. Now, what can I grow? Well, you can grow all sorts of things. Um, first of all, I can grow annuals. And you see um, at the Empress of Dirt, her wonderful tower there. Um, I can grow perennials. 
and there's some succulents. I can grow food crops. This is actually my neighbor's um, front yard with a big uh, one of, uh, it's actually just um, a big pot tray. Uh, and she's, she's growing salad greens, chard in it. And I can grow water plants. Um, there it is at the bottom. Um, so you can grow all sorts of things. Um, annuals are usually your hanging baskets, your wonderful flowers. Perennials, they can be herbaceous. Um, for instance, flowering plants or bulbs that disappear for part of the time. Uh, you can have non-flowering foliage plants, you know, like hostas um, or evergreens. Um, and you can have shrubs, which are evergreens or deciduous. You can have trees um, and the water and bog plants um, uh, are always fun. I have a little one in uh, in my front yard because that's good feng shui to have a little waterfall. I have a solar uh, water fountain that floats around on the top. Um, you can do food crops, which are vegetables, berries, fruit trees, nut trees, um, and you can even grow sprouts and microgreens, um, but that's an inside crop. It is in a container, doesn't have soil. Um, in other words, you can grow just about everything, but you have to know right plant, plant right place what type of soil and water and what cultivar to choose and we'll get into cultivars so it is rather like a a, a regular garden isn't it um the difference is is that it's more confined and you need to think of those things ahead of time to set it up correctly but once it's set up correctly the maintenance is approximately the same as an in-ground garden the difference is that it's all in a little bit little bitty pieces that can be a disadvantage because you can make more work for yourself it can be an advantage because you don't have to do it all at once so let's talk about cultivars for containers spent a long time putting this together um, and um, here's fruit trees berries dwarf conifers and i chose um, low uh, to moderate water conifers because um, that's a concern for containers. Uh, flowering shrubs. Um, I took this from the middle group, from the native uh, or the Habitat um, Acquisition Trust for native plants. And because pollination um, is um, always a concern with container plants, um, having natives uh, around uh, is, is very important. And these are ones that they decided um, work well in containers. You've got sun, part shade, mostly shade, full sun, good choices. Um, here you have flowers and herbs, and I always have my herbs in containers. I would not be without them right next to my kitchen where I can get them. And this is from uh, West Coast Seeds. Um, very, very good um, West Coast Seeds, um, but their uh, seeds are very expensive but they probably have the single best uh, pullouts for planting times and um, harvest times. So um, worth, worth getting the catalog to look at. So the last group are um, food gardens. How to get started, huh? Well, Salad greens are easy, Asian greens are easy. And I made a note here, you can make them as fillers in perennial containers. And 54% of the world's food crops are grown in containers. That, when I found that out, that was, that really surprised me. Um, but that's what um, the, um, uh, I think it was one of the UN sites that talks about um, uh, gardening. Um, I have found that adding 25% more volume than what the tables tell you you can, you can use um, is your best bet because you, you're not worried. You see these um, three plants um, on this patio. We have a tomato, we have um, uh, a cucumber, and we have a chili. And they're very decorative. They're very, very pretty. And they're well balanced in terms of design because you either go 50 50 or you go two third plant one third pot um, but for food crops you don't have to worry about beauty so much and um, 
That's why I um, included this one on the right, which is a picture of one of my um, uh, old food gardens. Um, I had about, at that time, I had about 300 square feet of uh, vegetables in the ground, plus um, orchards. Uh, I had seven, seven trees and several different types of uh, berries. Um, but I wanted to have more space uh, for certain kinds of plants and I kept a year round garden and um, I wanted to be able to leave things fallow or have more um, versatility in combining my plants. And so I always kept um, a pot garden. And this one was at the end of my driveway in full sun. You'll see the netting there and the uh, the bits of flagging that um, kept the deer out. Um, and um, right there um, was a, a cucumbers. I was growing the little uh, piccolino uh, cucumbers, just wonderful for um, salads. Um, there I started my winter leeks. This was probably the end of June. So those are my winter leeks. I got started in the pots. Um, down here, I have two types of chard. The one on the left near the edge of the picture um, was my winter chard, uh, or I'm sorry, my spring chard, which I just got started. And the big one was the overwinter chard. So it was in its second year. And I was tricking it into being a perennial by uh, snipping out the um, flower stalks on it. Um, there, I have um, some mescalines uh, growing in a shallow uh, cactus pot. Um, there, I have the dill weed finishing um, because I'd be getting my gherkins in soon. And there, um, this, this picture is cropped. Um, that's actually um, a tomato, tomato plant just beginning to get into blossom on the, in the edge of the picture. And these things, I think, were kale plants, but I'm not sure. I don't remember. And right there, that was um, one of the totes that I had overwintered. And now you see the reservoir and the lid on top to protect the soil inside. And um, inside that is my planter. And I haven't put the uh, the the tube, the feeding tube in, or the the watering tube in, um, and that was would be uh, taken up, uh, taken off, and um, I would be planting um, some late summer plants um, over wintering. I think that held two kale, I believe. My kale would get quite big. So that's uh, um, the thing about the uh, food crops in containers. Um, now, just think that if 54% of the world's food crops are grown in containers, if you're an urban gardener, and I've been an urban food gardener for many, many years, um, it's really good news. You can, you can do it. You just have to observe the rules, and you can grow a lot of food. Now, um, what else here? Um, now you can grow food that uh, crops, you can grow any, any uh, type of plant that's not meant for containers, but you really will not do well with them. Um, there are so many cultivars to choose from. If you can find a big one, you can find a small one. Um, particularly with food crops, I, I tested different types of plants that were um, recommended for containers and those that weren't. Uh, you'll see that in zucchini, for instance, some are are very good for containers and others aren't. I grew um, a pumpkin one year that wasn't meant for a container and I got 60% production um, for uh, per vine. Um, to me, that's a waste of time. So next, um, here's some ideas. So you've got crops, you've got the cult of some suggestions for cultivars. You will find that some of these we don't get here. I tried to winnow as many down as I could find in local uh, catalogs. Um, here are uh, timing on days to sprouts and transplants. So just some ideas. There are many more, but it gives you a start, um, something to take with you to 
to send a, a gardening center or something um, uh, to set beside you when you're looking through catalogs like um, West Coast Seeds. So finally, let's get on to aesthetics. Talk about design and um, When we're talking about aesthetics, we're talking about the decor, the function, which is um, what is it going to do? Um, is it going to be a screen? Is it going to be a focal point? You can see, um, for instance, in the upper left, this is um, inside. And you say, well, that's just a pot of plant. Well, the function of it was that was the entrance hall to our place. And so it was deliberately very decorative. Um, so we have indoor and outdoor. And uh, you notice the one on the lower left, those are those are herbs, but it's also a tower. Um, uh, would be something good um, to create privacy. Um, you need to think about where your, your placement is, where your mobility is, um, and then how it's going to respond through the seasons. Um, if you're doing a perennial plant, you'll notice in the lower left there, they've got a tower of perennials. Um, but say you wanted um, a perennial in the middle and you wanted some color around the outside. Um, there's a couple of ways to do this so you don't screw up your perennial. You can plant your perennial a little bit high if its root ball will allow that. And then add your soil um, around it so the soil doesn't go up against the stem of the plant and that little collar of soil um, is where you would plant annuals whether it was salad greens or pansies or whatever the other way to do it say you had a japanese uh, maple is that you actually plant it a little low now of course these are grafted plants and you should never have the soil um, up high on a, 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 um, a tree trunk. So you take a yogurt um, pot, you cut the bottom out of it and you've got a, a collar that, will, that you put around your trunk. And so your, your annual, your perennial is a little bit low the collar protects the tree trunk, and then you fill in your soil around the side and you can plant your annuals there. So you get a lovely uh, design. Uh, <clears throat> I mentioned having culinary plants uh, near the kitchen. Um, uh, now, am I gonna change the container in the plant? Am I gonna have an annual uh, um, hanger plant? Or am I gonna do a pot, what they call the thriller, a filler spiller effect where you have one tall one you have the filler in the middle and then you have the spiller over top and that can also be done with the uh, uh, permanent plant in the middle and the changing plants around with the this idea this three three tiered idea um, or is it going to be um, a permanent specimen is it going to be like that first cactus we saw that is just stays there forever. So let's look at some different choices. Um, in the uh, bottom left, um, you have spring. That is just the most amazing display of bulbs. And they will all die down. They all go away. They get stacked in the shed till next year. Um, then they, they come out in fall, the soil's all plumped up and um, then they're uh, put away again to overwinter. Um, in the uh, uh, upper left uh, is a summer plant. That's Ceanothus, uh, California lilac. Wonderful scent, absolutely, well, all of these plants um, attract wild pollinators when they're blooming. So it's flowers in summer, it's evergreen, it's drought tolerant. So that can be a summer plant, but can also be a year round plant. They really have beautiful shiny leaves. Um, in the bottom right is probably one of my favorite um, pictures of a winter planter. Um, that's a red twig dogwood. And this would be about February. And that's a snowdrops, galanthus. 
and those that black, that's black mondo grass and it's evergreen. And then of course the um, dogwood um, becomes green, the galanthus die down and the uh, black mondo grass um, perks up and, and hides um, the um, the dead greens from the galanthus. So pretty spectacular. Now, um, the upper right is um, late summer and autumn. So you have a dahlia, beautiful um, one that is a natural dwarf. Um, over all the red leaves you see are hookera. Um, so that is foliage that is, it's a remarkable um, shade lover plant that uh, white uh, coral bells um, has these little bells on tall stalks, but it's really grown like hosta um, for its amazing foliage that comes everywhere from black to chartreuse green to yellow to all sorts of shades of green. So it's a wonderful pot plant and it's very well behaved. And then you'll see that spiky stuff, that's a, a carex grass, uh, a miniature grass. So here you have some ideas of how to create year-round containers that act in different ways, whether it's just seasonal bulbs or whether um, it's multi-season. Now, um, one um, type of container garden, oh, before we get onto that, I wanted to show you these, um, gives you an example. Um, this is this diagram, which is also in your handouts, um, is how to make a, a, a tower. And you saw a picture of that tower um, in the, um, the, the former slide. Um, here's a wonderful picture from the middle of the city, all around it, and, and a great um, courtyard. So um, how barren it would look without that green. And here's a, a tiny balcony. And what they've done is that they've, they've um, put um, uh, a screen on the wall and they've just hung all these plants on it it's got vines so um neat neat way to have green on a small balcony um also um i wanted to point these two things out because shade is often considered a big problem now we talked about uh, on the right we talked about hookara you saw that red and in the pot on the left with the stripy leaves, that's um, hosta. Look at those amazing burgundy leaves. That's hookara with its white blooms. And you'll see the red blooms down at the bottom left. That's also another hookara plant. Um, and in the corner left is a shade, uh, um, a shade loving grass. Um, you'll see another type of hosta over there. Um, and some chartreuse grass. So there's shady pots, but look at these succulents. These are all shade loving succulents, kind of neat. And of course, matching them with these wonderful old terracotta pots, um, very special. So a dry shady area um, and look at the different colors and textures um, can really be a beautiful and very subtle focal point. And if you added um, a very a few small lights at night um, at the base of these pots, you would get a spectacular effect. Water gardens, something that um, uh, really adds a lot to a patio or a small space. As I said, I have one near my front door and uh, because it's good feng shui, you always have a water feature at your front door. Um, I'm growing a native plant in it um, that's uh, um, well native to Eastern Canada uh, called a, a lizard tail, but it's invasive. Here. So um, it's a very interesting plant, but because I've got it in a small pot um, uh, that uh, was a recycled um, horse, um, grain uh, feeder. Um, it works quite well and it, it's it's funky and charming. And you can see in the upper left some examples of small uh, bog gardens. They're quite they're quite easy to keep and um, something worth considering um, whether it's indoors or outdoors. And um, 
often there the the concern is keeping a plant healthy and so i want to show you the most amazing plant this fig tree is over a thousand years old it's a uh, ficus carica and um it was recently um moved from china um, bought by a famous bonsai collector in japan so this is a thousand year old bonsai um now uh let me look at chat here um is there a master gardening group in couch and valley where neophytes can learn and join yes um we do have um several different districts uh, for the vancouver island master gardeners and um uh uh, let me see what's the best way to get a hold of us. Um, I will leave that information um, with Kendra and she can do that. Do water gardens have to be turned off in winter? Um, if the water freezes, then um, the plants will freeze. Uh, and as my water garden um, runs on a solar fountain and I simply um, put it back in the, uh, in the garage um, so it doesn't it doesn't freeze. Um, you can lift the bog plants out of a water garden and kind of put them in a small bucket to stay moist. Uh, you can do it. You can do it that way. Um, but unless the plant is rated um, as being able to freeze, um, then no, um, you you have to bring them in um, in winter. Um, and Mike, I knew someone was going to ask this question. Um, are raised beds just large containers? Yes, they are. And they have the same considerations. The difference with raised beds is that they're big enough that they become a hybrid um, between um, an, uh, an in-ground garden and a container. But yes, they are containers. And um, if you look down the pros and cons, you'll find that many, many of these apply. Um, what you're going to put around the edge of your raised bed is actually very important. Um, someone um, I knew took all their grass up and, and they're going to make a new raised bed. So they were very proud of it. And they said, look, and I just, just rolled that grass back and I'm going to grow vegetables in there. And I said, uh, you're going to have wire worms. So the wrong choice of container around the edge of his raised bed. Um, any other questions? What is the source for the 54%? I was, and I was trying to remember, Joanne, the exact source. And it was one of the, um, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't the UN, it was an international conference where they did um, uh, um, a bunch of statistics on it and that was where they discovered it. Uh, and what else? Oh, I've got one more up here. Come on, get to it. Okay, um, that's, um, that's about it. Um, here's some good reads. The ones with asterisks um, are at uh, the Vancouver uh, Island Library, and then some more that I've chosen. Um, give them a give them a look see. And here are some uh, good websites. Joe, did you get oh. to the question? Um, did you see the question about the large cast iron pots, or did I not? Hear oh you? no, I no I didn't. Let me shut this down, and then we'll have faces, uh, Kendra. Okay. Um, so stop sharing. Oh, and if you do have gardening questions, contact us at gardeningadvice.milnergardens at shaw.ca. The master gardeners answer all these questions. All you have to do is ask. So let's stop the share. Um, so the chat was? Uh, there was a question um, for a suggestion for the best location for large cast iron pots. Should they be, uh, you know, in a shadier position? I'm wondering if they're if they're thinking about the black cast iron if it gets too hot in the sun. So it should be, they should be large in cast pot. iron pots. Hmm. Okay. Um, 
if you're if you're if you've chosen a cast iron pot you're going to be dealing with rust you want to seal it on the inside if it's a true cast iron pot you're really going to have some interesting times trying to get drainage in it i'm not saying you can't but those are your considerations any metal container is going to be problematic in the heat in the sun because they're, they're just they're just going to cook things um so you want it away from uh the summer or the uh afternoon sun for sure um that those are those are the things that i that i can think of for um cast iron pots very very heavy i put them on uh on wheels um or have a way that you can move them um if you need to uh any any other questions uh do water gardens have to be turned off in the winter oh yeah um and that was we were talking about that um if as long as you can keep it running and it i mean you can have a, a lens on the top but if you've actually got a circulating system in your water garden then um as long as the water is circulating and it isn't freezing you're fine um you can keep um fish um in um ponds that are frozen on top as long as it's not frozen solid um but i was speaking about like my my bog plants i simply because it's a very small it's a water feature it's only about um 16 inches across and only about six inches deep um i um, take the bog plant out and i put it in a small pail uh and stick it in the garage where it where it won't um where it won't freeze um and now we've got another one here oh what's the old-fashioned milk paint yes you heard it right it's called milk paint and you can buy it at um a, a paint store and it its sole purpose is to seal um hot um against uh contaminating the plants and um you can even use it on the inside of uh, terracotta and yes it's called milk paint uh referring back to soil can you use any seaweed or only kelp can i use any seed meal or only kelp seaweed Oh, any seaweed. Yeah. Okay. Yes, there there are several kinds of seaweed. <laughs> You're quite right. Usually, the generic term is kelp. Um, you got macrocystis. You've got alarium. You've got all sorts of them. But generally, they're just called kelp. And um, uh, the um, commercial kelp that is locally produced. Um, is all under license. And so the kelp products that you get in the stores are all safe. There's no environmental damage. So um, I, I use uh, uh, both the uh, flaked kelp and then I use uh, um, a liquid fish. And um, there's also a really nice, I think, island product that uses uh, kelp. So it is, um, it, it, it is, yes, kelp is, I'm trying to remember the species. Uh, no, I can't remember the species. It's one of the cystus, um, but that's become a generic term for all types of seaweed. Oh, interesting. Um, how often should you fertilize containers? Does that really depend good, on the plant? Good question. What does the label say? Okay, the label will tell you how often to fertilize. Now, I find myself, if I've made good, rich soil, I only need to fertilize, um, depending on the plant, how, how quickly the plant wants to use up those nutrients. Now, food crops will take more out of your soil than any other plant because we have engineered them that way for thousands of years. Um, if you're growing a perennial, um, like a tree, uh, then the label says, you know, once in the spring, once, once mid-season, once in autumn, that's all you need. And um, often if I'm doing flowers, I will do it at half strength 
twice as often. Um, but generally, the fertilizers tell you to do it too many times in the season. And so what I find is that I just do it at half strength. Um, so if it says fertilize every two weeks, okay, but I'm not going to do it at full strength. And I played with it. And for plants that are really using a lot, like they're flowering like crazy, um, I will, and it says do it every two weeks, then I'll do it every two weeks. If it's a plant that is one blooming season through the year, I'll only do it every other time. I'll do it once a month because I'm my soil will support it and this is the point if you get your soil mixes and and you keep track of what you're doing um and you add your proper compost you add your compost to the other amendments get a super soil going then the fertilizer is there to help but the plant is fed by the soil so you feed the soil and the soil feeds the plant. When you make a plant rely on fertilizer, it's like feeding your kid on candy. Not a good idea. Okay, any other questions? I think one last question. Can you grow okay. roses, roses in containers? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Roses do extremely well in containers if it's a cultivar that likes containers. But there are many types of roses that um are um recommended for containers i did not put a rose list uh in there um and if you google roses for containers you'll see there are many beautiful varieties fantastic great thank you joe all right terrific presentation any last words joe before i sign you off um i'm just trying to think of oh Yes, I didn't think of it. The last thing for um, uh, being the person that asked to be involved um, with the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association, go to our website. We have a lovely website. And there Vancouver. it is in the chat. And there, yeah. And uh, um, you can learn all about us. You can uh, find out um, how to join. Uh, and um, there it is. Yeah, there um, it is. VM, uh, v, Vancouver Island Master Gardens, V-I-M-G-A, Vimga, um, right. .org. Right. And it'll take you right to our site. Yes, or I guess directly email info at msvmga. There we are. I'll bet, I'll <laughs> bet one. one. There's a master gardener <laughs> or two on the line there helping me out. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight.